Over time, there were fewer and fewer of them. Their genetic diversity declined. Cases of inbreeding have been discovered. Neanderthals found themselves less well equipped to fight diseases, as well as the constant changes dictated by their nomadic way of life. Neanderthals, the victims at our crime scene, demonstrated a weakness in their DNA in the very heart of their cells. To find out if this is a clue to their extinction, we need to look more carefully at their relationship to others. Did Neanderthals make the wrong type of friends? Were they wiped out during tribal conflicts? Or did they fall victim to a disease carried by a third party? In 1979, at Saint-Césaire in Charente-Maritime in the west of France, the skull of a young Neanderthal female nicknamed Pierrette was found with a large gash on it. In the Middle East, other fossils have been found with serious injuries to the head and limbs. Are these a series of clues which point to the consequences of a bloody war? Were Neanderthals perhaps victims of what we call nowadays a genocide? Did they come into contact with another species of human? Who are these strange humans with flat faces, round heads and elongated figures? with high rounded foreheads and faces ending in pointed chins, with long legs holding up slender bodies. They are homo sapiens. So are they the prime suspects in this investigation? And if Neanderthals came into contact with them, what's their story? The first European sapiens left the Middle East and settled in Central Europe around 45,000 years ago. Later, around 42,000 years ago, another wave of Homo sapiens migration settled around the Mediterranean basin and began to inhabit almost the whole of the European area. Forty-two thousand years ago. That's the date attributed to Pierrette, the Neanderthal female with a fatal head wound found at Saint-Césaire. This clue could well prove that there'd been a clash between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Could we then infer that there was already such a thing as war in prehistoric times? The conditions of life at the time, the low population, the vast areas of land, the abundance of animals, the ample amount of food, and so on, all show that there were no conditions that we're aware of that would have provoked violent outbreaks. So if there hadn't been any warlike clashes, what could the visible injury on the Saint-Césaire fossil mean? When there's a mark of a blow to the head, a single blow, it's impossible to know if this blow was delivered deliberately by someone else or if it came, perhaps, from a hunting accident. There's also the possibility, and it occurs from time to time, of it being interpersonal violence, but then it's just between two people and doesn't constitute a massacre. Sporadic clashes took place between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals but the evidence of the first mass conflict date back to the Neolithic era, that's to say between 12,000 and 10,000 years ago, which is well after Neanderthals died out. Pierrette's cranial injury is only a reflection of the difficult living conditions of archaic humans. The genocide theory, that is the deliberate annihilation of Neanderthals by sapiens, doesn't hold up. hunting accident, fall, interpersonal violence. There were many causes of injury and death in prehistoric times. Nevertheless, analysis has shown that certain bone wounds healed and recovered. It would seem that these injured men and women survived and got better, through luck or know-how. Did Neanderthals know how to look after their loved ones? 
Did they know anything about treating their sick? Or did they abandon them? In the calculus of a decayed tooth in a fossil from the Sidron site, Australian researchers found traces of an antibiotic fungus capable of destroying bacteria, as well as traces of willow bark, which is a natural painkiller. Neanderthals had medicinal knowledge for curing the aches and pains that they suffered from. They mastered nature's secrets like witch doctors. So perhaps Neanderthals were confronted with an illness from outside and to which they weren't able to develop any resistance. A disease from another continent, such as Africa, which Homo sapiens might have brought with them when they migrated to Europe. Could an epidemic have been the cause of the extinction of our protagonists? At Oxford Brookes University in England, Professor Simon Underdown found traces in fossil DNA of infections that Homo sapiens could have transmitted to Neanderthals. Could these diseases carried by Homo sapiens explain the disappearance of Neanderthals? One of the problems the Neanderthals would have encountered when these diseases started to take hold is it would have had a real impact on population size. Populations have to have a viable number of individuals in order to be able to reproduce. Um, if they don't have that, it starts to knock out those populations, ultimately leading to either localised extinction events or a much wider process of extinction on a, on a continental scale. The narrow genetic diversity of Neanderthals meant a large number of individuals were vulnerable and the reduced size of their population was a major handicap in fighting infections. Certain illnesses transmitted by sapiens, such as tuberculosis, clearly wreaked havoc on whole clans. Unwittingly, contact with modern humans meant that Neanderthal tribes succumbed to infections. Their population decreased over the course of time. Across the whole continent, the small numbers in the Neanderthal clans pushed them towards extinction. But even if diseases contributed in making our victims more vulnerable, this alone cannot explain Neanderthal's disappearance. So was it the ingenuity and creativity of Homo sapiens which hastened Neanderthal's exit from the path of evolution? During the 5,000 years cohabitation with sapiens in Europe, the last Neanderthal tribes were also developing new ways of doing things, such as these knives, which are very similar to those made by sapiens. This was proof of their incredible capacity to adapt, even if, by that stage, it was too late. Neanderthals and sapiens exchanged their know-how. But did they go further than that? Did they have intimate relationships which produced children? And did these children of mixed species themselves have descendants? To solve this mystery, we have to go further, examine the finds more closely, discover the secrets within ourselves, and get the DNA to tell us about these archaic humans. In 2010, Professor Svante Pabo and his team pulled off the amazing feat of deciphering the genetic sequences found in Neanderthal remains in the Vindija cave in Croatia. Thanks to the progress of molecular biology, these scientists at Max Planck in Leipzig sequenced this 47,000-year-old DNA. What these tests highlighted is that Neanderthal DNA is as close as 98.5% to our own DNA. Scientists now have a vital piece of evidence at their disposal. Neanderthals and sapiens share more or less the same genome. 
so it's entirely possible that the union of these two species could have happened. And in order to confirm this theory, scientists compared the genes of Europeans, Asians, Africans, Oceanians, and Americans with those of Neanderthals. The whole world was staggered by their conclusions. What we found when we first sequenced the first Neanderthal genome was that people that live outside of Africa today all carry small amounts of the Neanderthal genome in the range of 2% of the genomes of all people outside of Africa come from interbreeding with the Neanderthals. And we estimate that that happened somewhere between 50 and 70,000 years ago. Scientists now have proof that Neanderthals and sapiens couple together. Since African populations did not inherit Neanderthal genes, this interbreeding took place in the Middle East or in Eurasia. The union between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens happened during at least two periods in the course of history. Once around 120,000 years ago, and a second time around 60,000 years later. Neanderthals transmitted a part of their genome. Outside of Africa, every human possesses about 2% of Neanderthal genes, and they're never the same ones. Put all together, there is more than 30% of Neanderthal genetic material which lives on in us. This genetic input is a memory of our history, and also the history of the encounter between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Whereas many Neanderthals chose to unite, to interbreed, and to share with sapiens, others, through ignorance or a protective instinct, chose to keep to themselves or to take flight. The latter, who were in the minority, became more susceptible to disease and prone to attack from enemies. Their nomadic way of life caused a dramatic drop in their birth rates. Their population numbers decreased, and so their genetic diversity narrowed. The decline of the Neanderthals accelerated, and these men and women were eventually to disappear for good. Those Neanderthals who chose to interbreed and share with sapiens have passed on a precious legacy to us. We accumulate new genetic variation driven by changes in our environment. And we also gather new genetic variation by interbreeding with closely related groups like the Neanderthals. I think no one had thought that that was a very important feature in human evolution. Both modern day humans and Neanderthals have a common heritage. And even if they're no longer around as a related species, the memories of the journey that we made together live on. I don't make a sharp distinction between Neanderthals and modern humans. Those are two hominid groups, and I tend to uh, uh, put them uh, together. It's not just we are carrying certain amount of Neanderthal genes. In a way, we are all Neanderthals, as we are all modern humans. <laughs> the Neanderthals are human siblings, children of Africa and of Europe. Oh. Prehistoric athletes, outstanding craftspeople, skilled hunters, healers, doctors, and herbalists. Carers of children, families, and clans to the end of their days. Their heritage goes beyond the genes that they passed down to us. No one killed off the Neanderthals. Neanderthals live on in us.